Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part six of my Star Wars working, walking gonk droid. Yes, it is pretty big. It's also closer to the camera than I am, but it is about a metre tall. So it's about the right size for a gonk GNK or power droid from Star Wars. In the first few episodes, I did quite a lot of R&D on the leg mechanism. Check out part one for the full explanation. I've based this off some of my previous Android projects, which actually work quite well. So hopefully this is going to work properly. I'm pretty confident anyway. So we need to get some electronics in before we can do any testing. And that will involve feedback pots on all of the leg joints. We need to put in motor drivers, some Arduinos, and we also need to make up a simple remote control. And that's what's going to happen in this episode. Hopefully I can get some of it moving, but there is a lot of wiring to do, so we'll see how that goes. And after that, we can get on with the actual R&D to make it do something. There are several pieces we need to do, including some mechanical parts. So I need to uh, put some feedback on all of the joints. So I've made these grips here, which hold a pot and have a lever that goes to another stationary part. The ones on the right here are for the ankle and hips, and the ones on the left are very much like the way I did Ultron's elbow, uh, which are for the other joints. So basically there's a right angle with the pot mounted, and that should give me feedback and an angle exactly the same as those joints, and it'll become easier to see uh, how these mount when I put them together. We also need some grips that are gonna go on the studding I put in last time that make that pivot axis and hold the box on, so, um, I've made these which have space to put a nut and bolt through to grip an 8mm shaft which goes through the middle. Some of them will need to be freely rotatable so they'll have the flat face facing the piece they're holding. Some of them need to be solvent welded into place to actually make a mechanical grip on the shaft. So this top piece will be solvent welded onto the existing plastic and it's obviously still flexible enough that it can move and grip the shaft there without breaking the weld. I need to mount some motor drivers. I've decided to use the BTS 7960 again, although it's quite a bit of overkill. Um, I was going to use L298s, which are on the edge of being enough if I use both channels for each motor. We need about four amps per channel. But I've decided to use the totally overkill motor drivers because they don't cost much more and they're also much more modern. So I'm going to mount four of those per side of the droid on this recessed panel. And that's got offsetting blocks, which means it sits just behind where the front panel would be and that front panel would eventually screw onto the same holes. Um, so I could make that clear or with a clear window so we can see the motor drivers, haven't really decided yet. Basically there'll be two of these mountings which hold the motor drivers and uh, each one will sit behind this big panel at the top here. Uh, so we get four motor drivers on each side for the eight motors in total. We do have a ninth motor on the waste axis but that's gonna have its own motor driver mounted near the motor. We also need a remote control, so I've decided to do this um, thing here. All we need is buttons, really. There is going to be one slide pot that goes in this slot, and that's for basically altering the angle of the box so we can leave it and set it. It will dynamically change its angle to balance as well, but it'd be quite good to have that as a puppeteering feature. We've then got a toggle that's going to fit in this top right-hand hole here, which is for the motor enables. It's three buttons on the right which will be for activating sounds or whatever, and then some control buttons. So it's not something really we can steer around with a joystick, so it's going to have one button for walking forwards, uh, two buttons, one for turning left and right, and another two spare ones which might be for walking in a curve or for some other function. I've also left space here for a NeoPixel so we can have an RGB status LED. Here are my gripping hubs getting printed. Those are about 50% done, and I'm doing about 20% infill on those. I decided to print the motor driver holder and the holder that holds that piece all in one part. Slicer hasn't actually put a brim on those middle parts, so hopefully they won't warp too badly. If they do, I'll just print some more. Here come the brackets for the pots for each of the four main leg joints. Here comes the bottom of the remote control. And here's the first stage of the top.
Here are the little hub grips, so they go on the 8mm studding, which goes in just there. And obviously there's a bolt hole that causes this to grip, and that grips pretty well with friction, so we'll tighten that up across there. And that means that I can either have this attached to the shaft, and then it's smooth against the next piece, or we can solve and weld it on, depending on whether I want them to be attached to the piece they're next to, or run smoothly. I fitted those hubs in there, so you can see them here, here, we've got eight all together, and there's two on the bottom row. So the only ones that are free to move are these, so they're bolted to the shaft, but they run freely against the arms here, so this shaft along the bottom can rotate backwards and forwards. They're solvent welded on in all the other places, so they're solvent welded on here and here. This shaft doesn't actually rotate, it's just a holder that holds the top of the box, and the bottom ones here are solvent welded on and clamped on the shaft, so that this can't slip and the whole box stays square on the top. These are the electronics mounts, so I've got my four BTS 7960s mounted in each side. You'll notice there's quite a big air gap around them. I don't actually probably need the heat sinks. You can get a smaller device that is rated at 20 amps. These are rated at 40, and it's just got a small heat sink stuck on the front of the devices. Apart from that, it looks very similar. I only need four amps and not 40, so if these become too heavy, then I can take the heat sinks off probably, but for now we'll leave them on, but I'm not expecting them to get very hot. So I've got two of those for the eight motors. And then we've got another mount here for the Arduino. So there's an Arduino Mega on there. These little things here are to sit four Arduino Pro Minis on. And I'll talk a bit more about that setup later in this video. The 5 volt side is going to be powered by this USB power bank. Which should be fine to power all the 5 volt logic. And then we'll have another main battery for the motors. There's one set of BTS 7960s mounted up in there. Obviously, I've got the screws in the corner, so I can take this board out. If I wanted to, say, use another type of motor driver in the future, I could just put it in this piece with different mountings on. We've got another one of those on the other side. So this is the front of the droid. And around the back, we've got our Arduino mounted up there. And in here, I've got my USB power bank so that I can power everything and the power switch is handily on the top there. That may get relocated when there's a panel on here, or I might just have a hole to put my finger through. I haven't really decided yet. I need feedback on all the joints, so I've made these pot holders. Some of them are as simple as just a thing that holds the pot and a lever that goes onto the other part that moves, so I can get this in line with the shaft. For the main motors that move the legs sort of forwards and backwards, we need to have something a bit more complicated that goes across the corner on the inside of the leg. So as the leg moves, it moves the pot around, and I can't put those in line really, although I could, but it would sort of stick out of the side. So I've made these that fit inside, but that will become clearer once I fit them. These ones go on this axis, so this is the main side-to-side -side tilt axis, and we have another two up at the top for the hips, of course, which are up here. So we have a number of these, four in fact, and basically this simply goes in line, the pot shaft with the axis, and this piece will solve and weld on the inside here, which is the moving part, so as the ankle tilt side to side, it moves the pot and I can get the feedback. The other style is to go across the corner on my parallelograms, have a look at the previous episodes to see me making those, and that will fit in like so. So, hopefully I can get my hands out of the way and you can see, but as this parallelogram shifts, it will obviously shift the pot, and that should be the same angle we have on these corners. As I say, I could have stuck the pot on the corners, but it will stick out too much. I've made a battery mount that sits here and it's attached to these arms and there's a gap behind here so the body can still lean backwards and forwards enough. And it also brings the weight quite a lot forward here to balance it up. I've got one motor driver here which is the ninth motor driver for this motor. This motor at the moment doesn't feel torquey enough because I can back drive it really easily. So I've got one coming that's half the RPM and twice the torque but it's not here yet. The aim is, of course, that as the box moves backwards and forwards, it can offset balance. So if I put this sort of to this side, you can see it's leaning that way some more. And if I put it over here, then of course it's got a tendency to fall this way more. So actually pushing this will push the hips in the opposite direction like this, if I move it quickly. And that's what it's going to use to stabilise back to front. Here's my remote for Gonk. This is the remote for BB-8 version 3, so it's quite similar in size. This one's a bit wider. Obviously, I could have got the buttons closer together and made it more compact, but I thought it's a nice handheld size, and I can also change the front plate by printing a new one and putting some more controls on if I want, maybe an LCD or something. So that seemed like a good size. Um, I've got eight digital buttons on here, which are going to be for the various walking around functions and some spare for sounds and so on. I've also got the motor enable toggle that I had before on BB-8. And I've also on this one got this slide pot which will alter the angle of the boxes it's walking around 
So I can set it and walk along or I can puppeteer it to look up at people and then make a sound. There's eight digital buttons on this and one analog control. So the Arduino Pro Mini is fine to read all that data and send it over serial. That's the same Arduino I used in BB-8. And again, I'm using the HCO5 Bluetooth modules. There's quite a few um, instructables articles about pairing these. It's pretty easy by sending AT commands. So I'm not gonna go through that, but I'm gonna go through my serial protocol. I decided to write in some error checking. So I had some problems with BB-8 where I actually had a loose wire on one of the Bluetooth modules inside the droid. And that meant that sometimes it would disconnect and reconnect and some of the bits of the serial stream would get missed, which meant that some of these controllers Basically, the values went into the wrong variables on the droid and it did loads of unpredictable stuff. And I couldn't work out what it was for ages. I thought it was EMF or um, EMI interference. And I put ferrite rings on and things and eventually through prodding around, I found this loose wire. So I'm actually gonna put some error checking in this. So we have start and stop bits and any bad data gets thrown away instead of just putting it into the variables. It's also really important that I get the serial data flow correct for what's going on on the droid, because once it's got the Bluetooth data, this Mega is then gonna communicate over serial with four Pro Minis. And the reason for that is that basically there's not enough pins to run all of the eight or nine motors with all of the feedback and all of the PWMs that I need. So I'm basically gonna sub out two PID controllers to each Pro Mini so that I've got four and I can control the eight main motors. The Mega will control the front to back tip and read the IMU. So we do need to make sure the data coming from here to these on a common serial bus, uh, basically can each one can identify its data correctly and also throw away any rubbish data, although they're quite close together and they're wired physically, so there's no air in between and any other issues, we do need to make sure that data flow is correct, otherwise the joints will do weird things. I've taken the board out of the droid so I can work on it. So this has now got the Arduino Pro Minis all wired into power. They've just got a blink sketch on them, which is why they're blinking. And I've got the Mega here attached to the Bluetooth interface. I've just got a little bit of strip board there to distribute five volts to everything. I've also wired in the remote. So I've got the other half of the Bluetooth thing there and all the buttons and the slider wired into the digital and analog ins. I've got my NeoPixel sorted. So if I power this up by plugging it in here, Turn that on, we should see a red light, a green light once it pairs, and blue once it starts transmitting data. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the code there and we'll see what comes out the other end. Let's take a look at the transmitter code first. So I've just got the setup stuff for the NeoPixels. I've made all my variables for the digital buttons and for the slider. And we've also got this state variable. So one of the pins on the HCO5 Bluetooth interface goes high and low when it's paired. So we can actually tell when there's a Bluetooth connection before we send data. So I've got this variable here as well, which is a character called URZ. And uh, this is just basically the character Z is in that variable. And for the other Pro Minis on board, I'll be using the characters A through D. And that's basically an identifier each thing listens to so that it can work out that the data's for it. So I'm still using the same principle of error checking in this. So I'm just using a single character and that's between the remote and the uh, main receiver there. So I'm sending data every 80 milliseconds for this. Um, and that's fine really, because we don't need to press those buttons too quickly to make it work. The actual loop on the droid will run around every 10 milliseconds, so 100 times a second for its stability and so on. This is just the setup of the pins and setting up the serial there, which it transmits over Bluetooth. Uh, now I've got this uh, function here called pair, which is what it does when it's not paired. So uh, basically it starts with a low state on that Bluetooth um, state pin and uh, reads in the loop every time. So while it's low, it's not paired, it reads the digital pin, which is connected to it to see if it is paired. When it is, the lights change color. It waits a second, then finally changes it to blue, and then it will get on with the rest and go and transmit data. So at the start of my loop, I've got the thing here to uh, check the state, and if at any point it becomes unpaired, it repairs it before sending data again. Uh, this part here is just the timer, so this is using effectively multitasking code. Rather than using delay, I'm using millis, and so the loop will come around accurately and run every 80 milliseconds, and this will be very similar on the droid as well, but running at 10 milliseconds. Um, and the rest of this is basically reading those digital buttons and the analog slider, and then sending them over serial. And critically, I'm sending the URZ, uh, character Z, at the beginning and the end. And we're gonna use that to check that the data's in the right place, and those beginning and end bits are in the right place, and the data makes sense. 
this is the receiver code and at the top here I've got a variable called I am and that's expecting um, a character Z so that's basically what it uses to check the data is for it that's being transmitted and I've also got these two other character variables ident and ident2 which will compare with the start and end to check they're the same and they're the right character so that's how it checks the data so we've got all of the variables effectively twice here we've got read variables that get rid out the serial stream and if everything's right it'll then update the button and slide variables I'm also running a counter here so we can see the loop is running even though the data is coming more slowly um, at 80 milliseconds than the loop is running here which is 10 milliseconds this is the serial setup for two serial ports the mega has four so I'm using one to receive the data and one to uh, use for diags which is the one attached to the USB cable this is um, a, uh, basically a, the onboard LED on the mega I can use for the error state so in my loop again I'm uh, running this timer using millis so every time 10 milliseconds comes around it runs the loop and um, I'm checking here to check there's a sensible amount of serial data in the buffer here and then basically reading the incoming data so I'm reading ident and ident2 at the beginning of the serial stream and then does an if statement to check if the ident matches the I am character variable and ident2 does as well then all the data must be in the right order so if a connector came off and got connected back together if it was loose and some of the data was missing those characters would be in the wrong place and we could work out something had gone wrong and we can go into an error state so um, I'm also bookmarking the time when it does this the last successful update and then I don't do anything unless that update is within 200 milliseconds so bearing in mind it runs at 80 milliseconds obviously if it becomes disconnected that timer would be too big um, and then it would know there was an error as well so it's a pretty belt and braces approach to checking data is there and checking it's in the right order so first of all it turns the error light off it might be an external LED for the moment it's the onboard one and connected to pin 13 um, and then it basically all it does is at the moment outputs all that data to the terminal it also updates a count variable so that runs every time the loop runs so we can see our loop is running in a timely fashion and it's got not getting left behind waiting for serial data to come in more slowly if uh, the serial data doesn't arrive and doesn't get updated within 200 milliseconds it goes into an error state and tells me there's an error and writes data or writes an LED pin high so we can see there's an error state and I could make that do anything like make all the joints go to a default position so it doesn't fall over or turn on some other light or make a sound. I now have the receiver attached to my PC so I can get that data out of its USB to serial diags interface and I've got that just in the terminal here so we can see all of the buttons there are ones and if I press some of the buttons those should change to zeros as I do so which seems to be working and we've also got the slide pot there which is a variable about 500 because it's roughly in the middle and if I slide it up and down we can see that variable changing at the end the variable at the very right is counting tens of milliseconds so the third digit from the right should be counting seconds uh, which seems about right because obviously I'm only transmitting every 80 milliseconds but this loop is going around every 10 milliseconds and we can see that that count is still incrementing even though the data is coming more slowly so if I try and press one of these buttons yeah, that's more than fast enough uh, for the speed I need to update it, so I don't think we need to have that running any quicker sending the data since it's just triggering a function. But what will happen is, of course, if I uh, go and unplug the Bluetooth on this, or plug the, unplug the power from the transmitter, we should find immediately we get the error state because it's been more than 200 milliseconds since data was sent, and similarly if I plug that back in, it should eventually pair and... Uh, start up cleanly again but if it didn't and the data was in the wrong variables again that would trigger the error state so i started to wire in some power distribution i've got the battery here and a connector which will connect to it at the moment the wires just run over here they will go to a switch which will be on this back panel and then i've got some wires that run to the other side and tails that come out to all the motor drivers i've also wired the motor wires in in the leg there so there's four in each leg and the wires there run all the way up there's quite a bit of slack on them around joints and stuff and they run up there to the motor driver board the other motor arrived for the front and back axis which is now 100 rpm so it's much more torquey and that's wired into its own motor driver of course so this is uh, much stiffer now and stays put much better i've now wired in the potentiometers which are of course the two at the ankles the two at the side of the legs and the two at the back of the legs there for those hip axis and all of those wires run up 
and those are cabled into the analog ins of the Arduino Pro Minis. The plan is that the four Arduino Pro Minis will each run two PID controllers to control those eight motors so the analog ins go into them and eventually the PWMs will come out of this and go into the motor drivers. Then the Mega is going to run the actual walking uh, kind of gate and the walking routine and it's going to read the inertial measurement unit and it's going to send the serial data to these to tell them what to do. This one is also going to run the stability for the front to back stabilisation. I've wired in a switch for the enable pin on the motor driver so there'll be a soft and hard motor enable switch the same as with Ultron and that's the white wire that goes to the enable pins on both channels of these and these also need ground and 5 volts which is the brown and red wire and that's wired back to my 12 volt distribution panel and I've done the same thing on both sides. So I haven't had time to actually make it move in this episode but all that remains is to wire in the PWM pins, write some PID controllers on those Arduino Pro Minis and attach them with a serial bus to the Mega so that when I press buttons on here the Mega can tell the Pro Minis to move those PID controllers to separate positions trying to match the value with the pot from each joint. So next time I should at least have back to front stabilisation working, I need to add the IMU for that and I should have some sort of thing where I can press buttons on here and it should crouch down or do simple things. After that we can then work on it walking. So don't forget to subscribe for more updates on this project and other projects and also check out my Patreon campaign at patreon.com xrobots where you can get access to some exclusive rewards including all my videos early and access to a live broadcast with me. Alright that's all for now.